It's hard to imagine that there's ever been a greater champion for the cities of this province, and in particular its capital city, than David Crombie. It's also hard to imagine that Toronto's former tiny perfect mayor just turned 80. And at an age when many former politicians have long ago disengaged from the issues of the day, the city's 56th mayor is still the go-to guy on so many pressing issues. To take stock of a life in public service, we welcome David Crombie back to TVO. So great to see you again. Thank you very much, Steve. Good to be here. Do you feel 80? No. <laughs> I, I don't, honest. I mean, it's, it's, uh, I, I still get up in the morning when I look at the mirror, I say, gee, if with a good night's sleep, I could get rid of this. You know? <laughs> no, I don't. Well, we're going to do a bit I'm of Ralph. lucky man. Yeah, we're going to do a bit of Ralph Edwards here, okay? Oh, okay. Kind of, this is your oh, life. Oh, oh, okay. Because for a guy who's 80, you are still ridiculously involved in the public life of this province. You live, we should tell people here, you live across the road. I do. You live across the road, and it's taken us ages to set up this interview. You actually turned 80 on April 24th. I did. It's taken us this long to get you in here because you are always doing stuff. What is on your plate right now that you find particularly fascinating? Well, um, I, uh, I chaired a, a panel for the province of Ontario on the planning for the, on the future, land use planning of the future of the Greater Golden Horseshoe. Uh, and that took about eight months of, with a really excellent panel. We put out some recommendations in November and I'm expecting over the next uh, uh, two weeks or so, early, very early in May, we'll get the government's response. And I've already been meeting with agricultural groups, environmental groups, land development people, because they're all going to be affected by the recommendations we made. That's really interesting. Secondly, I chair uh, the Toronto Lands Corporation. Our, we get the sur surplus lands from the uh, school board. Uh, and we try and uh, either lease them or sell them, but what we try and do is uh, create community hubs out of them, and that's taken me back into the neighborhoods in Toronto, which, uh, which I really enjoy. And uh, I do chair the Nuclear Waste uh, Management Advisory Council, and I've done that for about a decade. So there were other things. I keep, uh, I'm keep. i involved with Myzeum, which is a really exciting uh, uh, digital, uh, the shortest way to describe it, a digital museum of uh, the history of Toronto. It's people, places, ideas, and things. And uh, that's now just a couple of years old, but we're moving very nicely. A new generation will understand history a little differently than my generation and previous generations. That's all? A little bit, here and there. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're gonna go back here because I wanna take you back 44 years ago. Wow. 44 years ago, right. when you won your first of three terms as the mayor of Toronto. Did you expect to win that election? No. Um, I, I didn't really. I'd spent uh, a term uh, in those days, it was three year terms, and I spent a term as, uh, as a counselor. I'd spent the previous five years in, in uh, dealing some community work and or helping organize a, a sort of a local group called Civac, Civic Action League. So I'd had a, a, a good number of eight years or so uh, in, in that world. Now, when I ran, uh, it was within my own mind, um, if I won, that was great, but if I didn't win, then I was happy with the, with the loss, as I used to say to myself, and believed it. Uh, but when we, when we slowly we began to win, then of course it was quite, uh, quite surprising to us. The last couple of weeks we knew we were doing pretty good. Once you took the mayoralty, what did you see as your mission in that job? Well, we, it, it is interesting because we'd spent the previous five years, as I mentioned, involved, previous six years involved in, in, uh, in local matters. So we already had in our heads uh, not all the same, but there was a group of uh, at least a, a slim majority on council who had very similar ideas about how the city should move forward. Quite frankly, what, were, what motivated us was, uh, uh, was the U.S. In the U.S., fine old American cities were falling before our very eyes. They were even burning, Detroit and so on. Um, they were hollowing out the core so that the, uh, because the American model of the city it, in those days uh, was that you lived in the suburbs, worked downtown, and you built expre uh, expressways to get one to the other. Um, that we saw is just uh, have no respect for the downtown and its possibilities. So we wanted to change the American model, and, and we didn't. There, there was nothing we could use. There were good American writers, Jane Jacobs and a bunch of others, um, but but we had no other, no other, there were no other practices that, that helped us. So we had to suck up uh, on our own understanding of our own roots and who we thought we were. Hmm. And that turned out to be, the, uh, that because we were deprived of any alternatives that we could see, that really turned out to be really good because it allowed us to be, it, it instilled in us a, a respect for who we thought we could be. Well, your vision for city building won. You won the day. Yes, they did. And, and, Still, and, to this day. To this day, the, the downtown core. Uh, bear in mind, the plan did not have 
a lot of people living, or hardly any people living south of Queen, mm. uh, that kind of stuff. So, so the idea of building and and uh, a downtown, we built a downtown plan. We also, of course, saw again today same kind of problem. Uh, um, the need for affordable housing. So we took on the housing issue very strongly, uh, and, uh, and and we built a number. We, we built a lot of housing, affordable housing, co-op housing, affordable housing in those days. So those were the issues down uh, downtown. Also the neighborhoods. We un we we discovered ourselves the the fundamental importance. It seems corny, but it's not um, of, of of neighborhoods. Na neighborhoods. Um, um, uh, are, are where new personalities are born and raised. Hmm. Forty years ago this year, you were running for your third term as mayor of Toronto. You were on this channel, in this building, doing an interview with Judy LaMarche about being the mayor. I don't know if you remember the clip, but we've Oop. gone to the archives. Oh Look my. at the monitor up there, oh and Sheldon, roll tape. Well, here you are, just about ready to uh, run for election again. Four years in the mayor's seat in Toronto. And you right. want some more. Why? Well, I enjoy the job. I, I enjoy about 85% of the job, which is probably a higher percentage than most people at their jobs. And uh, it's a, a place I've known uh, since I was a kid. Uh, I enjoy being able to influence its course of events, um, to deal with the, the... I guess when I was uh, younger and I used to uh, look at things in the city, I'd say, if I was mayor, I know what I'd do. So I finally got the opportunity and I've enjoyed it. Do you recognize him? No, barely. <laughs> <laughs> Lovely hair. <laughs> the thing that's, that sort of I was surprised in that answer was you said you liked 85% of the job, so naturally I'm thinking, what's the 15% of the job you didn't like? And the 15% stuck with me through all of my career. If you're a politician, you have to go to the functions, as they call them, mm -hmm. uh, indelicately. I'm sure there's a better word. But you had to, when you finish a good day's work, you had to go to a lot of formal things and shirts and ties were in order and all of that. That, that I mean, I, I knew it was part of the job, so I'm not whining or complaining about it, but that's about the 15%. Gotcha. You are, I think, most famously known for ushering in that 45-foot bylaw, yes. which was an attempt, I guess, to say to the developers of the city at the time, cool it, guys. We're actually going to take a bit of a pause in how we develop this city. And I, in hindsight, and again, for those who, who don't remember this, we're going back several decades, what was the value in doing that? Oh, and, and, and it wasn't just cool it. There was a far more uh, clear intent. Uh, in order to change the downtown that we were talking about a moment ago, um, you had to have some time, all right? Now, the Planning Act in those days, not to get into the weeds, but the Planning Act in those days did not allow you to create some time in order to do the planning because the, the development community, quite rightly, would go in and just look for a building permit, get a mandamus if you wanted to stop them, and you couldn't do the planning in any significant uh, way. So we had to find out a way in which to hold back the tide uh, for, well, it turned out to be two years. And we, we used all the new young planners, private sector planners, public sector planners, community interests, and we created a downtown plan which became the law in 1976. Uh, and uh, that allowed us, that the 45-foot height bylaw was simply a holding bylaw to give us the time. Now, it, it, it entirely could have been argued that we were doing it illegally but it would have taken about two years for it to go through the courts, which is all the time we knew. And if I could, um, a sidebar to it, uh, Bill Davis has had my enduring respect since before that, but, but, but he, was, he, could have, he could have upset us, and, and he did not. We talked, and he said, okay, you got two years, basically. <laughs> so I've always loved him for it. <laughs> As you see skyscrapers going up all over the city today, though, is there a part of you that is concerned that we're overdeveloping and adversely affecting too many neighborhoods? No, is the short answer. Um, there needs to be enormous attention paid to the existing neighborhoods as the change comes. Change will always come. We are building the vertical, walkable city. That's what we're building. That's where we're going to be for the next uh, couple of generations. Um, and so the, that it's to be expected. The important thing is to remember, I think, two things. One, well, you bring, when you make the change, you have to work with the existing community, but at the end of the day, you have to decide that this, you're not going to take in 150, 120,000 people a year mm -hmm. unless you've got a place for them to go. So that has to be done. I think the, I think the second thing to, uh, to remember is that these vertical places are also neighborhoods. I mean, I, 
They even have a local government called the condominium yes. law, right? Mm -hmm. And they've got gymnasiums and all the rest of it. So it is important to actually redesign some of those or have architects pay attention to the fact that these are family places and not just for singles. Mm -hmm. So, uh, no, I, 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 I think we've got a terrific opportunity, and I think the way we're doing it is about 85% good. <laughs> <laughs> we actually had you in here 10 years ago on the occasion of your 70th birthday. And I made the mistake at that time of hauling out a copy of Vanity Fair magazine, which I showed you, because it had then-Mayor David Miller in there, along with a bunch of other big city mayors, and I was trying to say, isn't this cool? Look how impressive this is, our mayors in Vanity Fair. And you took me to school. You <laughs> took me to the woodshed, and here's the tape of that. <laughs> oh, Sheldon, oh roll it, please. <laughs> Oh, you know what I wanted to show you here? Hang on a second. I don't know if you saw the latest edition of Vanity Fair magazine. Which camera should I show this to? Right here. Do you recognize the guy at the left of this picture? Those are all, those are big city mayors from North America, and the guy on the left of that shot is David Miller, the mayor of Toronto. Right. Did you ever make Vanity Fair, David Crombie? No, but I made the cover of Time. You made the cover of Time magazine? 1973. I did not know that. It's called The Greening of uh, Toronto. No kidding. Oh. So, um... What could I say? Move over Miller. He, he's a nice guy, but he's not Moses. He's, he's Miller. <laughs> he's Miller, not Moses. That's great. <laughs> That's a great line. Now, the, the, I, I want to hear the backstory about that cover of Time magazine and about what they did at, what, what 10 o'clock in the morning? 10 o'clock in the morning. Uh, 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 they, there was a note, uh, uh, their note saying that uh, they wanted to, to uh, uh, take a photograph of Time magazine. At any rate, uh, uh, Bill Marshall was my, my chief of staff, and Bill came in and he said, now, they want to take your picture up in the top of the CN Tower, and, and me and, and Heights have a big problem. So, <laughs> so I said, Bill, I, I, no. And he looked at me and said, they want to put it on the cover of Time. And I said, what, what time do we start? <laughs> <laughs> so we went up the, we went up the, uh, mm -hmm. uh, the uh, construction elevator, and I get there, and there's no sides. No sides at, at that time. It's only... Uh, and the uh, wind's blowing, and I'm, uh, God, I'm cursing Bill, and I'm cursing anybody that I could think of. Uh, and, and they have this box, and Boris Sprema, a wonderful photographer, oh, and a neighbor just lived over here. Uh, uh, he, was, he, he had two, uh, there were two other people with him. They put me on this box about that high, and they held my legs. And Boris said, I want you to lean back just a bit. When you look at the picture, it's all downtown behind me, mm -hmm. and that face looks like smiling David, but it's fear. <laughs> and that's how they took the picture. And you didn't know you could drink mu that much whiskey at 10 o'clock I, 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 I did go down and I said, pour me a scotch. <laughs> <laughs> yes. uh, okay, let's go again. Um, Judy LaMarche asked you the funniest question uh, near the end of that interview you did 40 years ago. And uh, let's play a bit of that and then we'll pick up from there again. Sheldon, again, roll the clip, please. If you died tomorrow before you had a chance to, to be elected or defeated, uh, on the 6th of December, would you, what, what would you like people to remember about your regime? Ron Haggard once said that, uh, uh, was a Toronto journalist, Ron Haggard once said that uh, probably my uh, epitaph ought to read, uh, he left it pretty much as it was, and, and which doesn't sound so glorious and grand, but one of the great strengths of Toronto, of course, is that the, the, the neighborhoods which have lasted generation after generation, so long as they continue to function well, <clears throat> um, is, the, is the basic strength of the city. Now that you've had 40 more years to think about the answer <laughs> to that question, uh, you want to have a different answer? No, I don't think so. I think uh, the, the key to any large city that change, well, I guess any city, but certainly large change, the, the changes come. And the real challenge is not the change is going to come. The, ch the challenge is how do, you, how do you absorb the change and within, within the community's kind of DNA, within its historical culture, you have to find the ways in which you absorb the change and allow a new generation to breathe, mm -hmm. allow a new generation to take its shot. And if you do it, that do it well, they will take a shot that is consistent and contributes to the continuing tradition of the place. Mm -hmm. It is how you absorb change. And that's, I think, we're doing a great job on it. You were so iconic as mayor, I have to say, that many people may forget about the fact that you actually left the mayoralty in 1976 to go into federal politics, 78, I guess, 70, yeah. uh, to go into federal politics. Yeah. You won a by-election in Rosedale. You became a cabinet minister in Joe Clark's government for a short time. Right. And then when Brian Mulroney came right. in in 84, you were a cabinet minister in his government. You and federal politics, what was the relationship like? Um, 
I enjoyed city politics more. Let me make that clear. But, but it was an entirely different kind of politics. It was party politics, which I was not used to. Um, uh, uh, I was without my family because I was in Ottawa. I moved the family up uh, for a bit, but then they went back because uh, I, I had a heart attack in the middle of it all. Uh, and so I was, it, was, it was not my, my normal habitat. I think that has to be said. But on the other side of it, I learned. I should have walked by... Uh, to the governor general say, here's my tuition fee. Uh, because mm. uh, what I learned about this country, what I learned about politics generally and about uh, how the federal system works was enormous, just enormous opportunity. I think uh, that that was the, I mean, I didn't know anything very little that I read about indigenous people and the North. I had two brothers who did both of that, who worked both of that, but I did not. Um, so I'm as minister of them, was called Indian and Northern Affairs, now Indigenous Affairs. Uh, um, I learned an enormous amount, and, and I'm still involved with it, with, the, with, with those issues. Um, so I got, a lot, I got a lot out of it. But I was nine years at City Hall and nine years in Ottawa, and it was also time to go. You also ran against Brian Mulroney for the leadership I of did. the PC party in 1983. Right. What's your strongest memory of that campaign? Uh, seeing a lot of the city, a, a lot of the uh, country. I mean, you, you're, you're everywhere. Little wee places, mountains. I mean, it was, an, again, enormous learning opportunity. Um, it was clear reasonably early on that I was not going to win. Um, but like when I ran for mayor in 72, um, uh, being really philosophical about it, I, I enjoyed the experience and, and was un, not unhappy when I didn't win. I, I had won in 72, didn't win in, in then in 83. Um, so it didn't fuss me that I that I lost. We ended up the campaign, uh, the only candidate uh, in the black. That's Everybody right. else was in the red. That's right. right? Yeah. And, and all these other people who are talking about fiscal responsibility, right? We're the ones that ended up in the black. <laughs> my good friend Bill Saunderson, he was he collected money for all of my campaigns, and I never ever cost me a dime, hmm. even including that leadership. Uh, so uh, I, 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 I and Brian Mulroney, I have to say. Um, uh, he gave me the job on, on Indian and Northern Affairs, as it was called, um, and I, it, it was a gift. It Were was you a surprised gift he put you? I mean, you, when you dropped off, you went to John Crosby. You did not support Mulroney, and he put you in cabinet anyway. Well, I, th he, I think he had to, uh, but, but uh, I, I don't think it was counted as one of the great ministries to have. For me, it was perfect, and, and maybe he understood that, because most, most reserves uh, then and still are, um, much of their major concerns, many of their major concerns, are municipal. Hmm. They are about housing, they are about plumbing, they are about education. And so I found that I had an enormous rapport uh, with local chiefs in, uh, and, and bands, uh, band councils, uh, on, the, on that kind of bread and butter, at that bread and butter uh, level. So uh, no, it was a terrific opportunity. And, and, uh, and uh, Brian Mulroney always backed me up in anything I had to do on it. So. He did have one great line at your expense. He did. Your, your, he did. your French wasn't, what, what should we call it? It was not uh, the most elegant Parisian French. I was just below tentative. <laughs> <laughs> and he used to say, when I win the leadership and the election and become prime minister and I make David Crombie my minister for Francophone affairs, and that always got a big laugh. It, it always did. Yeah. And he, it, it, we, uh, I didn't, I, John Crosby was a man I, re, uh, I respected, and so that's why I went there. But um, and didn't go back to Joe because we need the, the, they needed a change in that. Joe Clark. Part. So Joe Clark. So so uh, um, yes, uh, and I still see John Crosby. I, I see Brian Mulroney from time, but not very often. He helped me uh, put. What, well, it's an interesting story. It, when I left, he, he phoned up. He said, "Maybe this." I, I told him in, in '86 I didn't want to continue, but I was not going to disturb anything he had, he was doing. He just let me know when it was okay with him. I'd like to get back to Toronto. He phoned me up one day and, uh, and said, are you still thinking about leaving? And I said, you bet. And he said, when would you like to go? And I said, about Friday. Why? You go, what do you have in mind? <laughs> and he said, I have my man. And he was bringing in Bouchard. Uh, and so I gave a turnkey operation to Bouchard uh, with, his, uh, with my office and the way I went. And Brian called and said, um, is there anything, is there anything you want to do? And I said, no, I'm just going back to Toronto. I want to thank you very much. And, and then in came my, my good friend Ron Deering, Chief of Staff, and he said, well, how would the conversation with the Prime Minister go? He said, he wanted to know if there was anything, and I said, no. He said, that's code. He wants to help you out. <laughs> so he actually launched the, the waterfront of the, uh, the Royal Commission on the future of the Toronto waterfront. 
Well, funnily enough, that's what I want to talk about now. Oh, okay. Because that's a perfect segue. In 1988, you founded the Waterfront Regeneration Trust. Yeah. What was that all about? It was a rural, It started as a rural commission on the future of the Toronto waterfront, mainly environmental, because it had to deal uh, with uh, uh, with the federal responsibilities on the waterfront, and those were largely uh, environmental water and air and uh, air transit and stuff. Um, but then Mulroney su suggested that I might want to talk to David Peterson, who was then the Premier, and, the, and, and, and Peterson, after one year into the Royal Commission, joined it. So we had a federal and provincial uh, Royal Commission, which allowed us to a lot of latitude, and uh, we spent the next three uh, years uh, making recommendations to the province and to the federal government, but interesting enough, to the province in the main. And then uh, they, uh, Ruth Greer, who was then the responsible minister, uh, 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 who called me the other day and said, you better make damn sure you ask David Crombie in your interview about the waterfront. <laughs> so there we go. <laughs> oh, okay. Oh, God love Ruth. Uh, and anyhow, she, she started the, established the, uh, the legal form for the, for the Waterfront Regeneration Trust, which I chaired for the next uh, number of years. They honored you the other day for your connection to the waterfront, yes. a 1,600 kilometer waterfront trail and greenway from Quebec to Windsor. Yeah. Is that trail now done? Well, it's, it will never be done. Uh, it's now reaching in, and the celebration the other day was to, to celebrate the launch into the north part of Lake Huron, because the trail goes from, well, as you pointed out, to the Quebec border, down to Lake Ontario, Erie, and then up uh, Huron. Uh, and we're now moving into the northern part of Lake Huron, and then we'll go into Superior. And I've said to people, the purpose of the trail is not just recreation, hike and bike. Mm -hmm. It is that, but it's to bring people to the water side to be able to say we have a responsibility uh, to ecology and the economy and the community along the waterfront. That's mm -hmm. what it's about. That's the serious part of it. Uh, and so uh, that's why people have worked hard at it. So we'll, we will uh, uh, we'll continue on. Uh, uh, that's why it's not ever finished because mm -hmm. It, it, you're always going to need repair. New generations will come in with new ideas. So it will be a continuing platform upon which new generations of Ontarians uh, can know about their, the Great Lakes, which is the, the greatest resource that, that, that we can have. I hate to rain on your parade Sorry. here. Sorry. But the thing I most often hear about Toronto's waterfront is, why can't it be more like Chicago's? I guess there's a lot of people who think that we've kind of botched it, you know, that it isn't as good as it ought to be. What's but, your view? Those people are wrong. Uh, they, they, they really are. Ask them if they talk about Chicago waterfront. Uh, do they go in February? No. No. But, but they it's go when the weather's cold. good, right? Yeah. Well, like Chicago, we're a winter city. The city council, I was not there at the time, but they made the right decision. We want our waterfront to be a place where people live, work, and play, not just recreation. Okay? You stand, uh, and I have a book at home called uh, uh, Open, Free, and Clear Forever, The 100-Year History of the Chicago Waterfront. Mm -hmm. I've been there many times. I took lessons from it, and the lessons I took, I, I, I've tried to apply to Toronto. Uh, and and it, if you stand on Michigan Avenue, you look out across to the water uh, at, in, in, in the wintertime, you'll, you'll see runners. That's a, a hardy runners, and, and at night, just the cops and the muggers. So I, 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 no, no. Okay. Uh, we are doing the right thing. And people who mostly complain, I'm going to be a little unfair here, but mostly those who complain are those who are seeing it from the gardener. And mm -hmm. I would like them to get in touch with me, and I will take them for a walk. They can start anywhere they like, Port Credit, start wherever you like, and I'll show them a waterfront that is going to be, I think, will not be beaten in North America. I think it's amongst the top three waterfronts in North America now. Uh, along with what? New York, yeah, and probably uh, uh, San Francisco. Gotcha. Uh, of course, given what you've done for the last uh, many, many, many decades of your life, you've had a front row seat for a lot of stuff in municipal politics, which is why five and a half years ago, we invited you into the studio to talk about uh, the campaign which eventually elected Rob Ford as the mayor of Toronto. Right. And I asked you a question and you gave me an answer. We're gonna play that oh, dear. Go ahead, Sheldon, roll that clip, please. When, in the 2010 Toronto mayor's race, did you get stopped in your tracks when something happened and go, whoa, that's different? Yeah, I'm not sure it's chronologically exactly whether it was the first, but it was the first one that brought my head up. And I think that's when Rob Ford said he was going to get rid of all the streetcars, which was kind of a bold stroke. I'd never heard that before in all the years I've been involved. Uh, there may have been more to the story, but that's the way the story was put out. And I thought, that's different. Uh, it's different, and did you, when you heard the idea, did you like it, dislike it? Well, no, it was... no, it's, a, it's, it's an idea whose time will never come. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 
<laughs> an idea whose time will never come. Uh, Rob Ford never did get the streetcars out. No. Uh, but overall, uh, I do want to ask you though, what do you think his legacy is to municipal politics in Ontario's capital city? Uh, he did three good things, I think. One, uh, he, he brought, he reminded people that one of the jobs, one of the parts of the job of mayor is to deal with what he called uh, customer service. That, that you need, need to deal directly with people and, and, uh, and their needs at a given time. He, he was par excellence on that. Uh, in my judgment, he, that, that, that's not all, of course, what you need from the mayor, but he spent most of his time doing that. Secondly, he had, we had labor peace for four years. People have forgotten that. Uh, whoever was doing it with him, but they did a great job, and we not had uh, that kind of trouble. We had trouble before, um, and then I think I think thirdly, uh, he 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 was he was able to speak, and, and I think quite frankly, you're seeing reflections of this in the current American election, and maybe a little bit with our own when the election of Young Trudeau. Um, we we have. We've, we've lost our way in a couple of areas, and that is in affordable housing, that is the chances that people can get ahead. A new generation doesn't know how they're gonna work it. Mm -hmm. I come from a generation where it was, the opportunities were extraordinary, right? Now, th 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 this new generation is, is, is separated from us because they don't believe the same, and, and for good reason, they don't believe, believe the same kind of theology that we understood that we were engaged in civically. They don't, they don't believe that. And that's why that Ford spoke for those people, all right? And they're still there, and they still are, need, are, have unsolved problems. And that's what Trump and Sanders are, are, are bumping into mm -hmm. or, 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 or dealing with in, in the U.S. So I think he, he tried to give voice to that. His style was unbelievably bad, in my judgment. Uh, it, it just, uh, uh, so, and I, so I think he, he, he took a line of political style that was uh, hurtful. That's all you want to say on that? I think that's all I want to say on that. I mean, yes, the, the man's passed away early. Uh, and people, uh, he touched a lot of hearts, so it has to be remembered. Uh, there is going to be a Scarborough subway, uh, and probably wouldn't have happened if not for him. Do you like, uh, only because he was a huge champion of it against right. all the evidence that suggested it didn't make a hell of a lot of sense. Uh, do you think that the solution they've ultimately come up with here makes sense? No, I think it needs more work, <laughs> but, I, but on the other hand, I think like everybody else, we just wish they'd get something built. <laughs> mm -hmm. So we need pro probably less discussion and not more. Uh, but I, I was one of those who was on the panel. I was asked to be on the panel to, on the recommendation, and, and I, I uh, recommended along with the others uh, a, 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 an LRT and not the subway. Um, and I still believe that's the best way. They're trying to, they're trying to kind of jerry-build one mm -hmm. now, if, if I could put it that way. Um, um, and maybe we just said, let's, let's go ahead. We have fallen miserably behind uh, transportation. There was a time when I first came into it, all my predecessors, had, whatever they had done, they had the best transportation system in North America. And so, uh, and, uh, and we, for, while we were there, we made our contribution. We didn't put out any money at all in the last 25 years of any significance in terms of capital expansion. Um, we really let the TTC go threadbare uh, and that was partly a provincial thing, not because we used to get far more money for capital and operating from the province. Uh, and also, uh, and I ramble here a bit, I don't mean to, but, but um, affordable housing is so vital. They need to, we need to get the federal government, they're now ready, I think. Mm -hmm. They need to cut loose CM, CMHC and allow us to exploit it best we can. I was going to ask you about that because it, it, there seems to be a kind of a political simpatico, Justin Trudeau, Kathleen Wynne, John Tory, in a way that we, I, know, I mean, it might not be unprecedented, but it certainly hasn't been that way in a long, long time. No, you're, you're absolutely right. I think the stars are aligned. Mm -hmm. uh, I, 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 I admire those, uh, all of them. Uh, I might say, by the way, when you're noting 1976, when I ran for mayor, I had a very young 22-year-old law student run my, th my third campaign. I think I know his name. John Tory. Yeah. 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 It's still good looking. <laughs> uh, well, he's only 62 or he's something. He's only a yeah. kid. Uh, at any rate, uh, uh, that's... Uh, yeah, that was pretty good. Um, okay. Sorry to do this. No. Bill Davis once uh, told me, he's 86 years old now, he said, the, the, the tough thing about getting into your 80s is you go to too many damn funerals. I'm not sure he said damn, actually. But he he wouldn't said, have said damn. No, he wouldn't have said He would have use a longer word. <laughs> yeah. um, a year ago, you lost your son. 
Yes. Your son Jonathan died at the age of 48 from a brain hemorrhage. Yes. And I just want to know how you go on after something like that happens. Well, um, you, you, first of all, you do. Uh, the people find their way. They do it in digging into themselves. Um, he, I guess the first thing for me was that was helpful was that he had, he had a great life. He, he did exactly what he wanted to do. My wife Shirley took him to the Half Loaf Theater when he was 10, mm -hmm. and he never left, right? So he spent all of his life uh, on, the, in, in, on the stage, in theater, movies, whatever, television. Um, that was one thing. Secondly, uh, he lived a, a really... He, he was so modest in his living. We used to joke and say he waits for the sales at Honest Ed's. You know? <laughs> uh, he, he went to New York back and forth for 25 years of his life, and he always took the bus. Okay? Hmm. Um, and we brought, we brought his ashes back from Yonkers. Um, we, we took the bus ride uh, the, on the Johnny bus. Uh, so we, he left us with wonderful memories. Um, it may have been hard, I have to say this part, it may have been harder my wife's in, in, uh, in long-term care. Shirley's in long-term care. Alzheimer's? Alzheimer's. And, and I, had, I talked with my daughters. Should we uh, tell them? No. And we didn't tell her, and she has not missed him. I think it would have been much harder as an experience if, it, if she had had to face it, you know, her experience for me watching that. And so um, you dig in, and, and, and you keep going. Um, I have two daughters left, and... and <laughs> And uh, God knew what she was doing when she invented daughters. They are, they are great, and they made it so much better for me. You're at the point of your life, though, where you're supposed to be sort of enjoying the happy memories with your wife of a life well lived. Yeah. And as you point out, I mean, you were a caregiver for, for quite a Five time. Five years, yep. How tough was that? It's not, uh, that was tough. It was probably the hardest uh, in many ways because you carry on your life normally, mm. but, but, your, but your nights are well taken uh, in terms of care, for sure. But um, for me also, I, I still, she, uh, I've known her since we were 16. Hmm. Grade 10 French, early eight collegiate. Uh, so she still walks with me. And I, uh, I learned years ago from my mom mom, um, uh, when I walk down the street, I, I still have my ghosts around me. So I take walks through the village of Swansea where I was raised. I still know who's there. Hmm. And so I think it's a, it's, um, it's a creation of your own kind of heaven, if you like. Uh, here on earth as you if you can remember memory is really important to you and understanding how they might respond to new, new events that helps hmm. sorry you're only 80 years young I have to add because you're the youngest 80 year old I, with the exception of my father you're the youngest 80 year old that I know so what do you still want to get done in the probably 30 or 40 years you still have left on this planet? <laughs> I, I know. I, I, I want to keep doing what I'm doing. I want to keep enjoying life. You, you do have to change your habits. Every decade brings shed old, good old ones, bring up some new ones. So um, I, I want to continue doing work on the Toronto Lands Corporation with the neighborhoods and the building of community hubs. Uh, I certainly uh, want, to, want to continue with the work I'm doing in the, in the city generally. Um, and I, and I, I teach. I'm back teaching. Where I teach at uh, teach a course for living and learning and retirement. Uh, it's uh, uh, I te now teach it at uh, at uh, York U of T Ryerson and George Brown. <laughs> and I've okay. now got a new one. They asked me to do a new one uh, on the impact of refugees and immigration mm -hmm. on the history of Toronto. And I start off with Aboriginal Toronto. Um, and I'm now working like heck because I have to start those lectures or ten two-hour lectures in January. Uh, so for me, the, the parade never ends, right? It just keeps on getting better in that sense. And just to, uh, I, I was earlier today, I put in an offer to lease uh, a, uh, a place down on Front Street, and I'm going to sell my condo across the road. You're, you're leaving the neighborhood. I have to leave. I'm going to another neighborhood, though. <laughs> <laughs> and, and actually, so change is not something I'm afraid of. Change welcomes so long as I can put it in my historic context. That is awesome. David Crombie, happy 80th birthday, Thank and you. many, many, many more to come. Thanks, Steve, very much. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit supporttvo.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.